missions. So I, I wish I could say that I am going to uh, bring the last paper uh, together on sort of a happy note, but unfortunately what I'm going to talk about is the shifting grounds I'm going to talk about uh, is loss of archaeological data and loss of archaeological knowledge. Um, so I'm going to talk about stewardship and equity uh, within digital archaeological research infrastructures. I work for the Archaeology Data Service, which is a research infrastructure, um, and uh, how it ended up creating SIATA. Um, but the main, the main impetus for creating SIATA, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, just looking at sort of the, the history, uh, I mean, I know a lot of you know a lot about the ADS and what the ADS has been doing, um, but really what I'm going to talk about is came out much more out of the Ariadne project, which I know we've heard uh, Ariadne mentioned a couple of times already. Um, and Ariadne was a, an EU infrastructures project with uh, 23 partners in, with, uh, in representing 16 countries. And the project ended in 2017. It had, uh, it was a huge project. It had 17 work packages, uh, some of which were just pure research work packages. But it had a, the main sort of primary deliverable that the project had to produce was the infrastructure, so the aggregation portal. Uh, it was coordinated by PIN, and we were the deputy coordinators. And this is what the, uh, what the portal actually looks like. Um, it's an extremely simple interface. It's just a what, where, when uh, interface, which completely belies the uh, collaborative uh, and technical complexity that sits behind it. But that is a whole other paper that I'm happy to talk about. But just if people are interested in the Ariadne portal, interested potentially in using it. Uh, but we weren't just a, a project that had deliverables. Um, we also became a community, uh, which was quite interesting. So we were, we were ICT organizations. We were archaeological partners, which were the, the data providers for the portal. Uh, over the course of the project, we had uh, 15 associate partners join us uh, and contribute their data. Um, and we also had, as part of the, the tasks within the project, um, a variety of community building things that we needed to do, so transnational access, training events, we had uh, quite a few special interest groups. Um, but they were all meant to be completely outward facing, so nothing, uh, nothing within uh, the Ariadne partnership, it was all how do we interact with people uh, outside the partnership. But what we discovered, which was really interesting, um, was that we actually had quite a bit of lack of capacity within the partners that were actually receiving funding to participate, which we didn't realize. Um, and this was really sort of crystallized when we had a, uh, we had a conference in Rome in about, about 2016, I would say. And there was a, a paper that was given by the Ariadne partners from Slovenia and Ireland. They gave a joint paper together. And basically, they got up and they said, look, as far as I can tell, you know, what, everything that we've learned as being part of the Ariadne partnership and seeing what other countries are doing or not doing is that we have uh, absolute haves and have-nots when it comes to having some kind of excess uh, persistent and acceptable place for our archaeological data to go so that we can actually participate in projects like Ariadne. And that there's actually a huge rift that's developing as, and I know, I know we all write grant proposals, and we've got funders saying you have to innovate, you have to innovate, you know, we're constantly having to push and push and push in order to uh, make our um, funding proposals successful, but at the same time, we're, we're creating this huge gap where only a small number of uh, groups are able to actually participate in that. So that really hit me. It really, it was a, a sort of a pivotal moment for me. And what they really illustrated was the incredible lack of equity of what was, there were just a few places, a few countries that had some sort of viable option, the vast majority of countries 
had nothing and were not thinking at all about uh, forward planning for their archaeological data at all. Um, so I, I was really bothered by this. And uh, unfortunately, as I say, we didn't have any money <laughs> to do any sort of capacity building within, within the project. Um, so we sort of scrounged around and I said, well, I tell you what, if we, if we can find some money, I and uh, Kate Fernie, who agreed to, to help, um, we can come and we can at least run some data management workshops. If you let us know who, who is interested in doing this uh, and, and we'll come and do it. So Austria and Slovenia both accepted and we managed to cobble enough funding together to get Kate and I over there to run these workshops. And what was really... Uh, what was really interesting and, and surprising was they were standing room only <laughs> because data management is not the most exciting part of archaeology. <laughs> it definitely is not. Um, but what we found was consistent between, uh, between Vienna and Ljubljana that it was they were experiencing pressure from funders, pressure from their own institutions to put their data in a repository, make it open, fantastic. But there was no place for it to go. So funding wasn't even the issue. It was the fact that there literally was just no place for this data to go. And these two workshops were incredibly successful. And I 100% I attribute this to the local partners who organized them because it wasn't just us coming in and saying here's what you should do. They first of all worked incredibly hard to get all of the right stakeholders into the room. So the people who actually were in a position to create things, make changes, were holding the purse strings for different things. Um, and then they did something which I think was incredibly brave because they were both junior, uh, fairly junior academics. They went and they looked, they did a bunch of research and they looked to see what is the state of the art in our country when it comes to managing our archaeological data in the long term. Where are we at? <laughs> which in some ways is not something people want to hear about even. So the fact that they were willing to do it and just come out and, and they, both, they both gave the presentations in their native languages. They didn't, they, so that there was no possibility that anybody was, uh, that they needed to reach, um, wasn't going to be able to hear it. So it was really interesting. So all the key people were there, they were basically, told what the situation was, and then Kate and I were able to come in and say, okay, so we've identified this huge problem. Um, here are some things that you can do. Um, so, so, and it was really successful, and it, and it resulted in both countries in action. Things actually happened. Steps were actually taken. The conversation moved forward, which was incredible. So we continue to talk about what, what we can do, uh, how can we take this model, which worked really well, uh, and collaborate beyond the current network. And what we really real, realized, and I got, I got a question in, at EA in Bern, uh, somebody saying, well, surely we can't, can't we just build something for all of Europe that's going to work? And I was like, no. <laughs> That's not, that's not, you know, taking ownership of the data away from uh, regions or countries is not going to give any sort of ownership, long-term ownership uh, to that data. And, and how that data, how we're going to make this work is, you know, one size does not fit all. It's got to be uh, people figuring out how can we make this work in our own country. And the other thing that was really inter interesting and something I've been thinking about a lot is that, and something that I, you know, even in this conference, I certainly was seeing as well, is we continue to conflate the, the data itself with the ephemeral way that we interact with it. So even the Ariadne Plus portal which is millions of euros, I look at that and I say, that is ephemera. <laughs> that, is, 
that is not something that is going to be necessarily working in 10 years time and we wouldn't expect it to. But what is the long-term trajectory of the data that's housed in that portal? It's an aggregation portal so it's not a good example. But um, we are constantly, I think, conflating the trajectory of our applications and the data itself to the detriment of both. So I feel like we really need to spend some time focusing on the long-term stewardship of our archaeological data. That really needs to be an area of research and collaboration that we, uh, that we look to. Now, <laughs> archaeological data also has some particular challenges. So uh, as we know, we've got uh, archaeological excavation as a destructive process. Um, the data that we're creating with our careful documentation, um, even things that are like um, uh, deterioration of monuments, things like that, what that data we're creating is primary data. We're not going to be able to repeat getting that data again. Um, at the same time, digital data is much more fragile. It is much more subject to obsolescence. And this is a, a picture of Tim Evans, our deputy director, contemplating a whole range of obsolete formats. Um, so we need to, I mean, and, and if you just think about it and say, okay, well, do I, am I using the same hardware and software in, will I be using the same hardware and software in five years? Maybe. Ten years? No way. No way. Um, so, <laughs> basically, we are going to lose an entire generation of archaeological knowledge to the digital dark age. That's what is happening right now. So it's an urgent problem. <laughs> Uh, so I uh, was really thinking a lot about this and I went to a meeting for a different project and I ran into this guy named Costas Dallas and he, uh, um, who's not even here for me to name checking. Um, and I was both wound up and excited about these workshops but also feeling really dejected about what they had exposed. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, you know what you need to do? You need to create a cost action to do something about this. So I did. So SIATA, uh, Saving European Archaeology from the Digital Dark Age. I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I hope you can understand <laughs> without preload why I, why I chose this name. Uh, it is, um, we're six months in. I know ArcWork has got about 18 months left to go, I think. Uh, so actually there's quite a bit of nice uh, crossover in a lot of the things that ArcWork has been doing that potentially can uh, be part of SIATA. Um, and I very much wrote it uh, to complement ArcWork and ISTO was extremely generous and let me see the successful ArcWork <laughs> application when I was designing SIATA. And actually this graphic uh, on the right um, was created by Federico Ortelli, who is the scientific officer at cost for both uh, Arcwork and SIATA. And she is trying to actually sort of pull all of the cultural heritage um, cost actions together into her portfolio, basically. She loves cultural heritage uh, projects, so she's trying to pull them together so that she can actually help us connect uh, connect with each other better as well. And, and you can actually see, so uh, SIATA is C818128, sort of in the center there, and just above it is ARCWORK, CA15201. And you can see that thick green line between, between the two, which basically shows that there is a huge amount of overlap uh, between the two of them. So, um, so SIATA has, obviously, research coordination objectives. Um, the most, uh, the, the, the basic one, I think, is, is we need to collect information about what the state of the art is for Europe and, and beyond when it comes to the preservation, dissemination, and reuse of archaeological data. Because I don't even see how we can start to address the problem unless we get some sort of a handle on what the depth of the problem is. And I don't think we know that at all. And what I would love to do 
is, and the plan basically is to have, create a series of uh, sort of interlinked publications over the course of the action where we can sort of draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is the situation and then what are we going to do about it so that we can move into a, a place of action. Um, obviously, we're, we want to work together to develop common understanding or understandings around best practice. And then, of course, we do need to take action. So we need to develop uh, fundable projects to, be act to actually take things forward. So very quickly, the different working groups. Uh, so working group one, stewardship of archaeological data. And I very much tried to design these so that they are linear, so that you can find yourself where you're at in the process in one of these four working groups. So stewardship is just how do we start the conversation? Something needs to be done. How do we start the conversation? How do we decide, uh, how do we share with each other the common encouragements and resistances to doing this work? Because there are lots of, lots of very common things that we, we know about and we can talk about. Um, and I think just in, just in general, irrespective of where, where you're at, we need to be spending more time really talking about who should be responsible for the short, for sh the short and long-term preservation of our data. Because I think we all have really good intentions. We really have the best of intentions for our data. But I think there's very often our stewardship capacity is unrealistic. It's not really the main thing that we're interested in, but we want to kind of, oh, well, I'm just going to keep uh, trying to work with it. We, we have had some examples over the last two days about projects that have gone on for 20 years, but they are certainly the exception. Usually we, we live in a project-by-project uh, project funding cycle where we've got to go on. We've got to do the next project. Uh, we, we can't continue to work with and migrate forward that data after five years or after 10 years. Um, so I think in general, it's a conversation we really need to be having. Uh, working group two, planning for archiving, completely practical. Right, we've started, we've started the conversation, we've got some money together, we're going to do something about our data. What, what are the practical things that we actually need to talk about? What kind of software? How do we uh, train people to do it? How do we... Um, think about future proofing if we're going down a particular software direction, uh, all just, just completely practical. Working group three um, is best practice. So uh, basically for existing repositories, so you have a repository, how do you connect with other people and, and work on best practice together? And this can be anything from the, the FAIR principles, so FAIR, findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and reuse um, has become just incredibly important over the last couple of years. Um, I want to be a trusted repository. How do I deal with accreditation? Uh, I'm taking other people's data and caring for it. How do I cost it in a way that is that is uh, acceptable? What are the different all of the different data types that archaeologists produce? How do you what's best practice around that? So so things like that. And then working group four, which has turned out to be our biggest and most popular uh, working group, which I think is uh, sort of the new frontier, really. Uh, I think we've spent, um, for those, for established archives, I think we've spent the last 10 years talking about interoperability. I think we're going to spend the next 10 years talking about reuse. And that is uh, reuse that is, um, we're, we're fairly good at tracking quantitative reuse, but we're constantly creating these uh, um, applications saying we're going to create new knowledge, we're going to create new knowledge. Well, how do we know? How do we measure it? How do we, uh, how do we look at legacy data versus collecting new data? How do we, um, I just, I feel like this is something where we've spent too long just, well, and, it, and I shouldn't say too long, we've gotten to the point now where just having the, making the data openly available isn't enough. It's time for us to start thinking about uh, actual qualitative reuse, which is going to be hard work. Um, so the planned activities, if you're all familiar with cost actions, you know exactly what these are. Um, but obviously, this is a cost action. And it means that if you want, if this is something that you think is important and that interests you, 
please talk to me about getting involved because as I say, we're six months in, uh, there's tons of work to do. We're just getting ready to do our working group one exploratory workshop next month. Um, this is our, uh, we've got a Twitter presence, um, which is Seattle underscore, underscore cost. Um, we also have a website, which is seattle.eu. Um, and just to also mention, um, so Ariadne, the next phase of Ariadne Plus, or Ariadne has just started, it's called Ariadne Plus. Um, I had a slight panic attack when I realized actually Seattle and Ariadne Plus were gonna run concurrently <laughs> over four years, but I think it's actually gonna be fantastic because it's even, it's much more about capacity building this time. It's 41 partners, most of them are archeological partners, and I think uh, the cost action and Ariadne Plus will be able to uh, really amplify each other. So I think it's going to be it's going to be fantastic. So I, I hope this hasn't depressed you too much. I hope that this is maybe a little bit of a call to action, um, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for presenting us this uh, new opportunity to work in digital data on uh, in uh, archaeological. Uh, research and well as I see it started where uh, this cost action will finish in Zagreb my hometown so <laughs> it's kind of symbolic too. okay so questions please good afternoon Holly um, <laughs> I'm going to repeat myself uh, my name is Anna Cruz and I come from Portugal. Um, I don't want to be mean to you, but do you mind to go back to that wonderful, um, that, uh, no, the first one, please, that wonderful rectangular that uh, most people that speaks French, the, uh, the, the beginning, in the beginning, just in the beginning. It, it, there is a lovely rectangular that everybody knows as Algarve. No, one of the the the, the, pro, the map. I mean the map. the map. Please. Again. Oh yeah, over there. So as you see, there's this, a, a lovely rectangular yes. uh, by the Atlantic. Uh, seashore uh, most of the people uh, um, even in uh, in Castilla e Leon uh, believe that uh, um, that lovely rectangular uh, is Algarve because the plate to Algarve in the autoway it's bigger than one that uh, show the way to Spain so I would I would like to know if you did uh, uh, some contacts with with people from DGPC uh, which means uh, general direction of uh, uh, Portuguese heritage uh, because I the, see, as you understand, I, 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 my English is very poor, I know, but I see a dot in Castilla, Castilla e Leon, uh, but I, I do not see a dot in Algarve. <laughs> so, don't, don't, I, I, I don't mean to offend you, but uh, I just would like to know if you did spoke with the, the authorities on archaeology in Portugal. So I, uh, this is from the first phase of Ariadne, which ended in 2017. Uh, the new phase of Ariadne that started six months ago uh, does have, I mean, there's, there's no significance to where the dot is in the, in the country. It's just saying we, have part, we had partners in Spain. But not, this, in, this, but not in Portugal. Now we do. Ah. And if you would like me to look up the specific partners for you after this, I'm very happy to do that. Yes, 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 I yes would like. no problem. No I problem. would like. Thank you very much.